I'm really excited about this dish. It's the whole time beef bourguignon. Um, this dish has made and break a lot of cooks and a lot of chefs. Uh, it is intriguing. It's, you know, forever eternal. It represents basically what cooking is all about. Understanding the quality of the ingredients, understanding um, how to, that great dishes sometimes take time to achieve, um, you know, that specific um, flavor and texture. So, I'm really excited about explaining how to do that. So beef bourguignon, um, what do you require for that? You require good mirepoix of vegetables and over here I have um, a mixture of small little baby onions, some carrots, some celery and I have a very nice bouquet garni. Now you notice that I left um, the mirepoix slightly chunky because this is going to be a really slow cooking uh, process and what I want is by the end of the cooking I don't want to end up with very mushy uh, vegetables so always um, cut the vegetables according to the length um, of time of cooking. Then um, I have some beautiful ribs over here and they're absolutely gorgeous if you have a look at the marble um, that is here. This is basically what we call a cheap cut which in my opinion is it's an unfair uh, classification because it doesn't mean there is an inferior cut. What that means um, is that it's perhaps a cut that needs to be processed and cooked in a different way. So this type of cut will benefit better by having a very low, slow cooking process. So that's very much what we're going to do. We're going to marinate this and then we're going to very, very, very slowly um, cook this beef in order that it pretty much is going to fall off the bone um, you know, when, when we're uh, about to cook it, when we're about to eat it. Then, another very important and perhaps the center part of the beef bourguignon, it's wine. We're gonna use a really nice dark wine over here, very um, high in tannic, as you can see. Um, I tend to favor wines that are high in tannic content, very, very robust uh, smell, um, because they tend to make a much denser and a much richer uh, sauce afterwards. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna start up by boiling this wine. So what I mean with that is that we need to remove the alcohol out of this wine and we're going to reduce slightly so we have a much thicker consistency on the wine. So I have a hot uh, pan over here, so I put it here for a bit so it gets nice and hot and I'm going to add the wine and immediately what I want to do, I want that wine to come into a boiling point very, very quick. Be very careful, don't put the, you know, don't put the, the wine in an extremely, extremely hot pan because sometimes you can burn the wine. But a nice hot pan like this, it'll take no time for the heat to come you know, to the boiling point. And literally we want to evaporate the alcohol and we also want to get rid of about a third of the, um, of the content of this wine to a much thicker consistency. While that's taking place, I'm going to remove um, these bones from the rib. And you could leave it on. Um, but maybe what I want to do uh, with this is that by the time when it's cooked, um, I, want to, I don't want to be looking for bones here and there. So I'm using rib here, but you could use any other cuts, things like ox cheeks, fantastic, um, great cut. Uh, things like, um, you know, feather, a blade, which parts of the animal that really have a lot of collagen, connective tissue, they'll be just fantastic. So with this, Ribs, I'm just gonna go around those bones and literally remove them, like so. Just contouring the bones, making sure that you don't remove too much of the flesh. And again, you always look for a purpose for this. You, this will be fantastic, you just freeze it down, and then later on we can do the most fabulous uh, stock with it, you know, beef stock. Um, you can actually do a beef stock and then use that beef stock to garnish your beef bourguignon. So always look for ways of utilizing the whole produce that you buy. So like so, and one more bone. You can ask your butcher to do this for you if you still have um, a butcher. Now, I wanna cut, cut this into quite chunky pieces, not too small, not too big, okay? So we're looking at about this size. So that's, that's gonna be a perfect size, why is that? If it's too small, 
during that two and a half hours um, cuisson that I'm expecting, you might end up um, that the meat will dry far too much, okay? Then again, if it's too thick, okay, it will take longer to cook, which means that, you know, we might end up overcooking all the vegetables, plus um, you might end up kind of drying the meat as well too much. So this will be, you know, a very good size for your meat to be. So all equal sizes, like so. And we're gonna repeat the same process on the other two, and then we'll be ready, you know, to, um, to marinate this. So I have all my meat prepared, all the bones out, and my wine reduced. Remember, reduce a third of it. Okay, don't let it reduce far too much. So what we're gonna do next is we're going to cool down the wine. And why are we going to cool down the wine? Very simple. Why you don't wanna add that hot wine into the meat and to the vegetables? Very simple. That hot wine will start to eventually coagulate all the albumin in the red meat, will oxidize it, and we'll release a lot of uh, sinium out of it, which will make a really unappealing um, texture uh, to the sauce later on. And plus, you don't want to overcook the vegetables as well. So what I've done over here, I have a bowl sitting on a bowl, and I have some cold water, and I had actually a little bit of ice underneath. And I literally want to cool down this. So what's the temperature that this should be cooled down to, you ask me? Should be pretty much at the same temperature of your body. Um, not too hot, not too cold. If it's too cold, not good as well because um, you will not have the depth of warmth that start blending in all the flavors that carrot with the celery, with the onions and the meat and the bouquet garni. So not too hot, not too cold. Best way to do it is just by using the back. Again, why am I using the back of my finger? Because that seems to be a bit more sensitive so you can tend to see you know, with better detail where you know, how hot it is or how cold it is. So I'm gonna do this until I feel pretty much that it's lukewarm, same temperature, and then we're going to blend all this together, wrap it in, and leave it to marinate 24 up to 48 hours. Now imagine, I'm using beef today, you could use, you know, chicken, uh, you could use rabbit, you could use lamb, any other dish that you love, um, you could replace um, exactly using the same technique. Okay? Uh, always remember that parts that will work better, it's parts that have a lot of collagen, a little bit of connective tissue. So you want to save your prime parts um, to do grilling or sauteing. But for dishes like these, you want something that has a lot of muscle tissue that will give um, the texture and the jellifying texture that we're expecting from this um, dish. So I'm happy with the temperature now. I just checked and it's perfect. So we're going to now um, just pour that over the vegetables and the meat. So what I can start by doing is just get the meat onto this bowl. And you see what I selected this bowl on purpose. I want to make sure that I confine all the mass to a very small area. Why is that? The smallest the area, the less quantity of wine is required for you to submerge all of this. It's important that every single vegetable, every single bit of meat is submerged on the liquor overnight. That lick is going to literally impregnate you know, the, wine, the, the meat and the vegetables with the wine flavor and vice versa. A lot of the flavor will come out of those. So I'm going to add a few pinches of salt, not too much because remember salt overnight can start actually curing a little bit. But a little bit of salt helps to break down and bring some of the flavors out of that meat. I have some peppercorns over here which I'm going to literally just crash them slightly. I love to use whole peppercorns for dishes like this and just sprinkle over the top like so and now our wine which is ready to be used. And we're going to pull that over. so and we're going to literally bury all this meat all the vegetables and press it down and making sure that the wine submerges every single one of them you see what I've meant about selecting a very small ball so by the time that you press it down everything can literally be submerged I'm going to show you another tip um, when you do this 
So the best way to do it is by keeping this in the fridge or in a larder, so if you have uh, in a cool place, that this could stay overnight. Um, back in the days, an old geezer would just put this in their cellar and leave it there for one or two days. But you can use a piece of uh, cling film surround wrap, like so, and just put it over the top. And the reason I like to do that is that wine, if left exposed to oxygen will oxidize. I don't know if you had that experience, you leave a, a bottle of wine open overnight, uh, will react very quickly with the oxygen and will create a very um, oxidized um, taste. So even if you keep it in the fridge, make sure that you always put a little bit of cling film over the top, like so. One is gonna keep the wine you know, over the top of every bit of meat and vegetables, and two will prevent a lot of the contact with the oxygen, okay? That's layer number one, and then you can have one second bit of cling film over the top, like so. Nicely wrapped, and this is now ready for you to leave in the fridge overnight or somewhere nice and cool. And what we're gonna to do tomorrow, we're going to carry on with this dish. So about 12, 40, 24 hours up to 48 hours um, doesn't do any uh, harm to it. If you like a little bit more strong flavor um, of wine, you can even uh, for even longer than that. We're going to drain that, separate it, and we're going to carry on with the cooking process. So for now, we're going to have to put this in the fridge. So beef bourguignon, our meat and our vegetables have marinated overnight. So what I've done so far, it's separated all the components. So get yourself a nice colander and drain in all the vegetables and the meat and make sure that you reserve all the wine that we um, had marinating because that's the essence, the liquor of um, this dish. So what I've done as well, I've separated all the vegetables into an individual bowl and also the meat. What I've done with the meat as well, and I made sure that it was really nice and dry. And why is that? Because we're about to sear this. Um, so if the meat is a little bit too wet, uh, when you put it in the pan, it might end up start getting a bit uh, stewed and we're not gonna have the, 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 the crunchiness on the outside and the development of flavor. That's why um, make sure that you pat it dry. So a nice oven to a table um, casserole, uh, something like this, which is made out of cast iron, great conductor of heat, because um, this dish will take about two up to two and a half hours uh, to cook. So you want a very slow cooking process and you want a pot which really conducts all that um, heat. And then for garnish, uh, what I've done here, I sauteed some mushrooms. I had some pancetta, smoked pancetta, which I uh, caramelized as well. So I started by caramelizing the pancetta and then some of that you know, fat of the pancetta, I just tossed in uh, the mushrooms and then at the very end, a little bit of salt. Remember, we already have the salt from the pancetta, so I, I don't tend to add, and then just sprinkle with some parsley, and that will be the garnish. I've seen a lot of recipes where people actually put the pancetta and the bacon and the mushrooms with the beef bourguignon. I tend to uh, find that it will get a little bit soggy, so I like the element of texture, so what I tend to do, I keep that separately, and then at the end, whenever it's cooked, then yes, you can fold it in or sprinkle on top and you have the crunchiness. So we're gonna start up by um, caramelizing the meat. So I have a little bit of clarified butter over here. And why clarified butter? Because we don't want this um, butter to burn because it's gonna be searing the meat there for a while. And you have tendency to get a little bit of burn from the protein. So I can hear this sound. It's telling me that it's nice and hot. So we're gonna season the meat up from a height, making sure you have an even spread amount of salt, okay? Remember you can always add, and then some pepper as well, freshly ground. We already have a little bit of pepper there, so don't go crazy with that. And now we're going to put our meat searing in this pan. Now, I've seen some recipes that you just put all the meat raw. I find it by developing a little bit of caramelization on the meat, you're gonna have that flavor because color equals flavor, okay? So always look um, to punch the meat first. Again, I could be having rabbits over here. I could add chicken. The process would be exactly the same, okay? So good sound. That's exactly what you want to hear. And we're going to monitor the cooking of that for two, two three minutes. 
making sure that you always hear the sizzling sound. So if it starts getting a little bit too low, what I would recommend is to take perhaps half of that meat. It's probably telling you that you're, you're not, your oven is not hot enough, your hob is not hot enough, and you not have enough energy to sear the meat. And instead of that, you start stewing. But as long as you hear this sound, there's a good sound, okay? So that's gonna be ticking for a while. And here's another tip for you. We're gonna to have to use some flour at some stage just to thicken up a little bit of the, um, of the wine and the sauce. But what I tend to do, I tend to toast the flour. Why is that? By toasting the flour, then again, you have a really nice nutty flavor and that flour becomes a bit more digestible as well. Uh, so what I've done, I just literally sprinkled some flour on a flat tray and add it in the oven, simple like that, for about 15 to 20 minutes. And you can see it's starting to get a little bit of coloration already, comparing the two. And you can actually do this, any sort of um, dish that requires a little bit of flour to emulsify. Uh, why not having a little stash of cooked, butter, uh, cooked flour that you can use? Just a simple touch will make the whole difference in terms of taste. So I'm happy uh, with the coloration on this. I'm just gonna leave this here for a, for a second and then we're gonna use that later on. So back to our beef over here. I'm going to start having a look and see, and you can see that we already have a little bit of coloration. That's exactly what we want. It's a nice coloration. So using a pair of tongues, I'm gonna flip this to the other side and always keep checking, making sure that the sound is there. This is what we call the sound of a happy pan. Yeah? Keep it happy. The smells are just amazing. Um, no wonder a lot of people that cook a lot, they constantly, you know, smell it because they learn to identify information out of smell. So I always tell this as a Number one rule, when you cook, engage with what you're cooking. Learn to listen, learn to smell, learn to touch, taste, and analyze information and take action, okay? Sound, smell, sight, that gives you control, okay? So this is coming uh, close to what I want. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna remove the meat from there, leave it on the side, and we're going to then toss the vegetables in the same fun and the same caramel that is coming off of that meat, okay? Good sound of here. Always make sure that you keep stirring the meat as well, making sure that the butter does just sit there because you might end up start burning the butter. So great coloration, I can see that straight away. The, tenace, the tons of brown over there on top. So I'm gonna remove that before we put the vegetables. A good practice is always Get your heat low, because by the time that you, know, you take all the meat, you don't have the butter just burning over there. So lower it down and take the meat to the side. So great brown color over here, great caramelization. And I know if you start getting that kind of color, you start to develop the flavor. So always look for browning color and smell, of course. Really great. So our vegetables, again, we're going to do exactly the same. We want to develop that browning coloration because brown equals color equals flavor and be patient very easy to lose your patience and think okay this is probably done but dishes like these that you probably you know for the past 24 hours dreaming about it thinking about it and you come into these later stages you might as well just wait another two three minutes since you waited overnight for the marination and making sure that you have the right caramelization on the vegetables, the right caramelization on the meat. All those little steps is what's gonna make your beef bourguignon the best beef bourguignon. Great, I can see the first signs of caramelization taking place on the vegetables. So over here, you can see the browning on the onions and on the garlic. That's flavor right there, okay? So I'm ready now to carry on with the next stage. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna lower the heat down and we're going to add some flour. So what I've done, I had my toasted flour and I just decanted it into a, a little bowl like this or you can put it in a little whelk jar and use it. So I'm gonna take some of it and I'm gonna sprinkle over those vegetables. Why am I putting that at this stage? Very important. If you do this at this stage and you just rub all the vegetables 
amongst that flour, that's just going to break down every, any little lump that you know, might be in that flour. And then what we're going to do next, we're going to start pouring in our wine from yesterday and we're going to start thickening it up the sauce. So bit by bit, add and stir, add and stir. You can see starting to thicken up nicely. I don't know if you've done sauces like these, like um, bechamels or, or any velouté. So the flour has starch and basically by putting you know, um, a liquid onto a starch and then heating it up, that starch expands and that makes you know, the sauce go thick. And that's very much what we want. We want to thicken up slightly this base so we have a great consistency, not just that thickens up, but also that mixes you know, the fat with the liquid. And that's important because fat, unfortunately, you know, um, as much as we hate it, it's great flavor there. Uh, and that, that just gives the, the, you know, the dish an absolutely extra layer. So we added the, um, the wine. I can see it's starting to thicken up. We're going to now add all our meat and starting up by putting all the juices from the resting and then we're going to bury in our meat in there making sure that every single piece of meat is submerged in the fluid so if you think oh I don't have enough wine to uh, cover all the meat just use a little bit of water okay so water is your best friend when you cook and remember water is a valuable ingredient we very often forget about water so I actually tend to use really nice filtered water, clean water, when I'm doing stocks, broths, because that will give my stocks and broths and soups a much better taste. So here we go, just like that. I have my bouquet garni over here, which I'm going to, again, bury in in the middle of this. You can, what we can do, actually, while we're talking about this, I can show you how to do a little cartouche or cartridge. Very simple, and we can put it on top of this to prevent a lot of the meat to get exposed to some of the heat. So, if you have a little bit of in parchment paper, like so, very simple. All you need to do is to fold that in half, like so. Okay, and then you fold it again in half, like that, and then you keep going in halves, like so and another, like that, and again, like so. You get yourself a knife. What we're going to do, we're going to find out the radius of this pan. So imagine the epicenter of that pan over there. You secure with your thumb you, the radius of the pan. You cut it just about there, like so. Take that little bit off, and then eventually something like that and that can go on top but before that I want to do something else you see a lot of what happens is as soon as the broth starts to boil a lot of the impurities will rise to the surface and it's important that we have a very nice clean broth so I'm just going to use my spoon and remove some of those impurities that always happens okay is nothing wrong that you're doing it's just basically a lot of um, uh, you know, very impurities that things will have naturally and that by coagulating the rice to the surface. You could leave it, but if you really want a very smooth, clean finish to the sauce, I tend to remove it. It just makes it a little bit more appealable to the eye. So I'm happy with that. Majority of that impurity has been removed. We're then going to position our cartouche or cartridge over the top, just like that, okay? So again, why are we doing that? That just keeps a little bit of the steam, prevents a lot of the meat and vegetables that are sticking out to get exposed to air and then eventually start to dry out. Remember, it's okay if the meat is sticking a little bit out because meat contains a lot of water and through the cooking process, a lot of that water is gonna come out and then eventually the meat will sink. If you start with a lot of water to start with and, and liquid, eventually you're gonna have a very watery base. So it's absolutely fine to be like that. Lid over the top, like so. I set up my oven at very low temperature. So this is at 250 Fahrenheit. 
which is a great temperature to have in the oven and by the time the heat penetrates in, loses a little bit of that heat because you want a very steady, gentle cooking on your you know, kind of cheap cut, which has a lot of muscle, a lot of collagen. So it's a, it's a labor of love and requires a little bit of time to do that. So patience required, again, for a dish like this. So we're gonna leave it, and I'm expecting this to take about two hours to cook, but what I'm gonna do, and if a recipe asks for two hours, every 45 minutes, up to an hour, you give it a check, just to see if it's cooking, what's happening over there. Don't think too much about seasoning at this stage, because it's still gonna reduce quite a lot. At the very last stage is then we're gonna start ratifying the seasoning. So I'll be back in about 45 minutes up to an hour. So around two hours have passed and I just by the smell can tell that that beef bourguignon is ready. I had a little peek, it's just perfect. So to complement our beef bourguignon, I'm starting to warm up my garnish. So I have a mixture of butter mushrooms and bacon, pancetta in this case, which I sauteed and caramelized and they're ready to go uh, with my beef bourguignon. So I'm going to now just check for uh, seasoning, just to make sure that I'm happy with the quantity of salt and the quantity of pepper and then it should be ready to serve. So let's get this over here. Oh my God, this is amazing. So as you can see, that little protection that we add earlier on has kept the moist on our beef. And because of that, we should have a really nice, delicious and soft so what you need to look for is using a spoon to, and then press it gently. So actually what I'm gonna do is to take some of this beef to the side to really explain what you are looking for. So as you can see, when you tap it, it has like a bouncing. And then you expect this that was initially very tough to be able to just cut through like butter with a spoon. So if you press it down, that eventually should just fall apart. And you can see that collagen that we had earlier on, that's what's gonna give this beef bourguignon the most incredible taste and the most incredible texture. So perfectly cooked, definitely. It is a dish that has been around for hundreds of years. And in 100 years time, they're gonna be done exactly the same way. This is the example of a perfect recipe. You don't need to change anything, just perfect. So. Let's ratify the seasoning. So I'm gonna taste a little bit of the sauce. If you find your sauce a little bit too runny for your liking, what's stopping you from taking some to the side, dilute a little bit of arrowroot or cornstarch, thicken up and then add to it, just to get a little bit more body. It's beautiful. I'm just gonna add a tiny little bit of salt and a little bit of lemon. You could put a little bit of reduced wine, red wine. Maybe a mummy in France would just reduce down uh, red wine and it becomes really nice and, and kind of sweet and sour. And then you can add at this stage just to give a little bit of sharpness. Or you can just reduce a little bit of vinegar and then add at this stage. Or simply just use a bit of lemon. That would be just perfect. So then what I'm gonna do is to give it a little, remember, this is very soft, the meat, so at this stage, when you add seasoning at this stage, make sure that you just use a little bit of gravity and shake the pan. You really want to avoid being stirring around because you're going to break down all that lovely meat and vegetables that has taken us so long to get to this stage. Remember, this, this dish has started yesterday. Perfection, absolutely delicious. So let's go and feed our guests. So as you can see, all the onions and the carrots and the celery have remained intact because we had a very gentle cooking and because the size was just perfect. So ways to garnish this, you could uh, simply serve this with a nice selection of bread. I personally like to do a very nice mashed potato to go with it, fantastic. Um, I have some kale, which I just sauteed earlier on, 
great complement for dishes like these. But any sort of greens uh, will be great. Uh, like I said, a bit of mashed potato is fabulous, or just a nice selection of bread could be a wonderful way of complementing this dish. And of course, a glass of red wine. That would be just fantastic. So some of this sauce. Like so. And then what I'm going to do to finish this up is I'm going to add my garnish over the top. Again, I mentioned earlier that I don't tend to cook the garnish inside of the beef bourguignon because that just literally will make at this stage all the bacon will be kind of soggy but it wouldn't be nice when you eat that you have that bite that crunch that comes through and you just literally sprinkle that over the top like so like that and then some nice scale to go with it. And there you have it, a nice classic beef bourguignon. As for garnish, a nice sauteed uh, kale. Enjoy.